Hello everyone, my guest today is Kevin Tan. He's an accomplished entrepreneur and advertising industry technology leader with over 20 years of experience. He's the co-founder and CEO of IOTA, the global leader in audience data with more than 3.5 billion unique profiles across Europe, Asia Pacific, and the Americas. Kevin, are you ready to take us to the top? All set. All right, what is, you bet, what does audience data mean? Audience data is really uh, information around any consumers. I mean, because so audiences, we start off providing audience data for kind of media and advertising consumers, but I suppose data on audiences has grown to be more than just kind of the media consumption. It's really information and profiling of, of customers and consumers, um, and consumers can be you know, home consumers or business consumers, really based on their activities and, and their demographics. And who's buying this data? Are we talking consumer brands like PNG, or are we talking ad executives to you know target their ads better? Uh, a combination of all the above. I mean, you know, I think it flows down really from a lot of the brands. So, you know, the brands could be someone like a, a CPG brand, like a PNG. It could be a uh, it could be a you know a business brand. It could be a retailer, um, and it's also you know all the channels in between. Um, you know, the brands obviously are using it for marketing, but they are also using it for their advertising and targeting of their advertising. It's being used by publishers. Uh, you know, really across the gamut, everyone is looking for data to do kind of profiling and targeting. Uh, be it content or be it advertising. And data is a very competitive space. I mean, what relationships have you secured that gives you proprietary access to data other people don't have? Sure. I mean, you know, we we, we track 3.5 billion uniques across the planet, and our data is based out of a variety of different things. I, I suppose the base level, is, base level is based on uh, relationships with over 30,000 publishers around the globe. Where this is like an entrepreneur.com, those kinds of sites. Yeah. And, you know, those types of things, also other things, you know, it can be e-commerce sites, it can be dating sites. We collect a lot of uh, declared registration data from sites where you have to, to register and it's not just someone giving an alias. Usually it's tied into a purchase or something else. So there's information about, you know, information can be verified and validated. Uh, so we get a lot of declared demographic data that way. There's also, you know, data across a whole range of sites based on people's interests, the types of media they consume, the types of things that they buy. Uh, we also have a, another part of our business is the onboarding of offline data, and we're the, the company that does the largest amount of this outside the United States, although we do it in the U.S. now. We started outside the U.S., and we basically take offline data records, and those can either be from a brand or those can be from, say, a research company. We take those and we match those to, to digital signals so they can be activated in, in the digital How world. do you match them? What's the, what's the thread that you pull to connect those two? I mean, it ultimately is data. So we use a we use a, a proprietary methodology that's that's based on heuristic modeling. So we take a bunch of different data signals. So those could be you know things that we use, such as geolocation data, that could be demographic data, that could be private ownership data or interest, et cetera. So we have so many data points per you know per individual kind of consumer, and we use those to match up against data records. Um, the reason that we use this type of methodology globally is that globally there's a lot of different privacy regulations around the planet. And some of those don't allow some of the one-to-one -one matching that you do with PII, say with an email address or a telephone number. PII so, is personally identifiable information. That's correct. Yeah. So sorry, I, I tend to use a that's lot okay. of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but so you know, we, we've set up a methodology that you know that works pretty well around the globe in terms of privacy. It also doesn't require um, the backbone spine of direct marketing data that that works well for a lot of companies in the U.S. when they're trying to do this offline matching but it doesn't work once you leave the U.S. borders. So Kevin, how do you make money? What's the business model here? Uh, so we work, we, we help partners who have data basically turn that into something that, that can be activated online. So they will pay us a fee there. Uh, we like also- a help, It's a SaaS fee or? Uh, some of it is a SaaS fee. Other parts of the data, uh, other parts of the fee that we get are selling a lot of this data, either for some of those partners or data that we're pulling together and selling under our own brand. Um, and, and selling that on a, on a, either a, a flat fee or a cost per thousand or a data as a service fee. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to sell data. Um, it depends on really the channels. If you're selling within advertising, the advertising world typically gets sold just like advertising inventory gets sold, either on a cost per thousand or you know, on, on a kind of performance type of basis. If you're selling it within marketing, again, it could be you know, on a flat fee, on an analytics type of fee where it's a monthly you know, recurring service fee or data as a service. We, we do, we sell, we sell a lot of data. We also distribute data around different channels for people. And, and that's again, like a SaaS type. Feed. Are any of these revenue streams clearly like the leader for you or no, they're all pretty even. Um, I'd say probably the leader for us is where we started from uh, seven years ago, globally, that was building out a, an audience data marketplace. So it's a CPM uh, charging model. 
uh, that has been CPM. It's been percentage of media spend, and yeah. it's also and it's also increasingly you know monthly service fees to to some of the brands. Yeah, I've so we've had probably twenty CEOs on in this space, and they all like Bill Wise Media Ocean came on. I mean, it's all they all come from the old world, which is a percentage model, and they're all trying to move to a SaaS model, especially as spends being moved in inside teams themselves. But yeah. I just haven't met anyone who's doing it really well because you're having to manage multiple business models and multiple different channels, and it's a big clusterfuck. Like, how do you figure out what to focus on? But for, for us, we, we consider ourselves more of a technology or platform company. We're integrated into over 100 of the world's leading platforms uh, that you use and consume audience data. So those can be DSPs, they can be DMPs, they can be MarTech platforms, they can be you know content delivery systems, they can be native ad platforms, mobile platforms. You know, there are a lot of the world's biggest publishers. Um, you know, and and they take our our signals and they use those signals. And increasingly, we're bringing asks to take those data and to take that data and put it in his feeds into other types of platforms. So, you know, for us, it doesn't really matter how the economics of how it's sold on each of the different places. We do well, the big integrations. Yeah. The, the, the reason I ask, so have you raised money or are you bootstrapped? Uh, we bootstrapped for a number of years. We, we you know, we, we've been through several series of fundraising. How much total have you raised? Uh, we're not disclosing that at present. Oh, okay. I'm, I, my research team had this written down. I thought this was public. Well, no, the, the last round was public. We're going to be yeah. announcing stuff shortly. So, well, so what was that? Or, or do you want to make my audience go Google it? Uh, you know, the, the last, as of the series A, we'd raised $12 million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have all this right here. It's public, right? So, so you raised back at, on May 1st, uh, in 2013, a seed round and then another seed round in June 1st and then January 26th, a series A for 8 million from Global Brain Corporation. So the reason I asked this question is when you're having these, oh, go ahead, do you wanna correct something? No, no, go ahead. When you have these conversations, uh, pinning a valuation to a transaction-based model is very different valuation than a pure SaaS play. So yeah. that's what, one of the reasons I'm asking about what are you trying, you'll tell everyone you're a SaaS model because the valuations there are way better, but actually it sounds like most of your revenue is still coming in on the old model. No, you asked if anyone, I didn't say that most of our revenue is coming through the old model. You, your question was, or do any of these have, have a bigger a lead. chunk yeah. than the other one? Yeah. yeah, and that's just because that was our first. Well, and you said SaaS business. is not leading, correct? SaaS is not leading, uh, and that's, but that's not what you asked. You asked whether or not, what was basically the, the if any of them have a bigger share. And, the, and I, what I said to you was effectively the marketplace has a bigger share because it was our first series of business. I mean, we put out the marketplace, we followed programmatic around the world. The first places that we sold data were into the digital advertising ecosystem, into programmatic advertising. So obviously that being our longest business, that's been the one that kind of grew the fastest and that's where it started. I mean, that's the one that grew over the last seven years and that's kind of, hence the, the bigger chunk. The fastest growing areas are the areas where we're selling data as a service or we're selling uh, things on a SaaS basis where we're distributing data or doing onboarding as a service. Can you kind of teach us how you're thinking about the differences between selling it data as a service versus selling it on a pure kind of SaaS model, fixed fee monthly? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think people are, you know, initially when the business started, I think people onboarded data and sold it, um, you know, on, as, on a CPM, on a transactional basis, because that was the way that media was sold. So it was just really easy to append and buy it because that's the way the advertisers bought it. But when you say data as a service, like, are you saying this many records over this period of so, time? Yes. So, I mean, yeah. So what's happening right now is we're selling data. We, we tend to be selling data as a service into a lot of different brands and advertisers and publishers, et cetera and businesses who are consuming that data and using it for a wide range of service. They're, they're, consu they're buying a certain volume of data that they can utilize you know, for what, whatever purposes are stated in the contract over a period of time. So it's a recurring monthly subscription type. Yeah, of they're buying on a recurring model, a bag of popcorn, that pop, each kernel of popcorn is a different data point. As they eat the popcorn and the bag gets empty, they then need to buy that popcorn bag again next month. And so it is a bit predictable. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of that way, it's predictable. I think also, you know, if, if you look at the predictability, even across the transactional stuff that's attached to the ad spend, it is pretty predictable, you know, and we see, we certainly see that in our business. It's in, in terms of spend and very, very low churn rates in terms of if you're looking at advertisers on a monthly basis and we have thousands and thousands of advertisers buying our data on a monthly basis. But if you look at other businesses, you know, Jeff, I know Jeff Green over the trade desk is talking a lot about how they have predictability of their revenue, even though it's transactional, it's, it's much more uh, SaaS based, even though it's, it's transactional, you know, so, so I think you start to see this in a lot of areas, but, um, but, you know, we are actually seeing, you know, pretty rapid growth in 
the SaaS part of our business. Yeah, I mean, most people, the reason they're getting into SaaS is because the transactional side is decreasing because folks are bringing it in-house. Now, what you just told me, you painted that model for you as actually pretty strong. I mean, are you not seeing that eroding for you? The uh, the, the transactional side of where the people, side? Yeah, where these folks are bringing the spend back in-house because they don't want to pay the, uh, the tax. We're not seeing it because our data is being sold not only through advertising and media and to a whole bunch of other channels where it makes sense for them to buy it on a use case by use case basis. So, you know, yeah. PM or, or the like. So that part of our business is not really eroding. We're moving to, to, to a DAS model or a, SA, a DAS or a SAS model with a lot of the, the consumers of, of data through some of the media businesses because they're more equipped to deal with data on a bigger level. So they have the confidence to be able to buy and make a, a monthly commitment yeah. on it. Okay, let's go back here. Sorry, we got kind of in a, in a hole there, but I wanted to understand that. When did you launch the company? The company was launched in October of 2010. Okay, and where was your, I mean, where was your head at that point? Did you just sell a company, you quit corporate? Why get into this? Yeah, so I was one of the early guys in a California-based ad tech company called Adify, and I basically built out and ran the international company. After we sold the company off to Cox in 2008, um, you know, and, and basically did our earn out. My international team, we saw a lot of things happening with uh, the growth of audience targeting kind of in the digital advertising world. And we saw an opportunity to build out an, an audience-based business. Um, so we left and we set up IOTA. And so simultaneously, we launched across uh, four markets from day one. So you know, we, we built out the tech and kind of the legal headquarters was out of Singapore. We had offices in Sydney and Berlin and London from day one. Uh, you know, the initial- How did you, how were you funding that? Did you get seed funding immediately? Uh, no, initially we bootstrapped because we'd all made money off of the sale of the, of the previous company. So you put company. in your own money. Yes, yeah, so we put in our own money. You know, eventually found some private angels, and, and after a few years, we took we took some seed money out of out of uh, out of Europe, which was our strongest market at that point. Interesting. And what's your team size to date? Our team size we're, we're pretty small. We got sixty five folks. Okay. And are you spread out all over the place, or mostly in New York, or? No, we're all over the place. Our 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 tech team and our development team and a lot of the back office stuff is out of Singapore. We have strong commercial offices in New York, London, and city Sydney, and we've got smaller offices in Tokyo, Berlin, and Melbourne. And are you still kind of burning cash to onboard customers faster or have you gotten in a cash flow positive world? Uh, we're growing. I mean, we're, we, we, we're, we're just in the process of making some pretty substantial investments to grow the business. And that's in technology. That's also in some geographic and new product distribution, but the, the company's in pretty good financial shape. Got it. And when you, can I decode that and say, I mean, a lot of you're hiring new engineers to build out some of this stuff. Yeah, we're hiring new engineers, working on new products. I think there's, we've been in the US market now for a little bit under two years, and um, that has been a wildly successful kind of entry to the market for us. Uh, it, it's also enabled us to do some pretty interesting things because we realized that the tech and the development, uh, you know, the development that we had behind it, um, that we could do a lot more than we'd been doing. Um, this market's a little bit more sophisticated, and we realized we have some pretty interesting advantages, so we're deploying those pretty rapidly and, and launching some new products. If we just focus on your SaaS cohort, what have you been able to grow that to over the period of time that you launched it in terms of total customers? In terms of total customers, I mean, you know, I, I think the growth has probably doubled over the last two years since we started doing this. Okay, but um, like, I'm, I'm talking like, are you high touch? So like, you probably have a couple dozen or like five or like a thousand? Uh, it's somewhere between a dozen and a thousand. Okay, uh, that's still a huge range. I mean, do you employ yeah. a high touch model or no? Are a lot of folks like a sales, you're, are a lot of, is a lot of your team sales folks doing outbound high touch, high ACVs or no, it's more no touch self-serve? Uh, it's a combination. I think, you know, we're having success in some parts of the world with, with, with sales focused teams, but you know, being kind of a, uh, a low, you know, low head count company platform base we're we're, we're, we're doing a lot of stuff directly. Yeah. I mean, m most folks in this space, they have because of your past companies, direct relationships with call it a handful of maybe 50 clients. And they're usually able to pump enough value to those clients where they're making for themselves a couple million bucks a year and it works and it scales. Generally speaking, you're following that path. Um, in, in terms of what? Working so for example, uh, other people have complete, well, let me give you the counter. Other people have completely shut down the one-on-one -on -one relationships with publishers and they are doing a low touch 
SaaS model where people can buy access to the data set for 30 bucks a month. And the way they get to, you know, a hundred million dollar valuation or, you know, you know, a hundred million in revenue is they sell it to a thousand companies and there's two seats per company. That's a very different model than a high touch, 50 client, high relationship, take them to dinner in New York kind of model. I'm trying to get a sense of where you're at. I mean, so our model for, for distributing and selling our data all along has been to do a large number of integrations with a large number of different platforms to make our data available ubiquitously. And I'd say that, you know, we're, we're continuing to pursue that model, which means that we have, you know, we have lots and lots of clients. Okay. Got model. it. Got it. That's good. Do you have enough of a cohort where you're actually modeling growth around, you know, things like lifetime value and payback period or no? There's some of that, but I'd say it's early stage for us with that. Got it. Yeah. So, okay, good. That makes sense. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what was the last business book you read? The last business book I read was um, Weapons of Mass Destruction. Weapons of Mass. That's good. Number, math. Yeah. Like math. yeah. Yeah, I got it. Weapons of Mass Destruction. And number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? CEO I'm following or studying right now? Um, no, I mean, I like the, I like the, uh, I like the, uh, I, I like the innovation and the aggressiveness of, of what Jeff Bezos does. So I, I keep my eye close to him. Number three, what's your favorite online tool? Ooh, my favorite online tool. Um, I have to say, oh, that's a very good question. I have to say at the, the moment, um, you know, I, I still, I'm still loving what, uh, all the things my team is doing with Slack. Slack. Okay, good. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Six. Okay, that's good. And what's your situation? Married, single, you have kids? Married with a child. Okay, good. One kid, like like young, you're not getting sleep, child. One, one kid, teenage daughter. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, that that's not my sleep. That's not my sleep issue. And how old are you, Kevin? I am uh, in my late forties. Late forties. Okay. Last question. Take us back about you know late twenties. Take us back like twenty eight ish years. What do you wish your twenty year old self knew? Ah, uh, what well, I wish my twenty eight year old self knew. Um, I suppose that um that things come up and down in waves. You know, I, um, been through, been through a couple waves of stuff and, uh, and, uh, yeah, when, uh, when things are good, when things are good harvest, when things are bad invest. There you guys have it from Kevin. Things come in waves. Don't ever forget that. He cut his teeth in this space, making and growing a company very large before then exiting, doing his own thing, launching IOTA in 2010. They uh, had headquarters over many different locations, even right at launch. They now have 65 folks. Again, looking at a data as a service platform, a SaaS platform with their relationships back with publish publishers. They've got a large data set of 3.5 billion unique profiles across Europe, Asia Pacific, and the Americas with about, uh, well, north of $8 million dollars raised with the current announcement growing quickly. Kevin, thank you for taking us to the top. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.